Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then GraphWell is the solution for you. GraphWell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. GraphWell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to gravwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Elastic Security empowers security teams everywhere to prevent, detect, and respond to threats quickly through a unified solution. And it's free and open, putting you in control. Use Elastic Security to eliminate blind spots by analyzing all of your data, no matter its volume, format, or age. Stop threats at scale with automated threat and anomaly detection, and arm every analyst with fast search and integrated case management. Download or try Elastic Sim for free and experience the benefits of an open security solution backed by world-class security research at securityweekly.com forward slash elastic. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. Uh, make sure you visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcast. We've got a couple coming up, one with Rapid7, Todd Beardsley. will discuss the findings from the National Internet Cloud Exposure Report on August 13th and how to create and run a conference from the geniuses behind Layer 8 and Wild West Hacking Fest. Our next technical training on August 27th will teach you about boot hole, SIG Red, and SNMP Bleed, the best practices to prioritize and remediate now or visit securityweekly.com forward slash on demand for our previously recorded webcasts. Uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Jeff Mann, who's with us for this segment. Jeff, welcome. Happy to be here as always, Paul. Very nice. And, and missing Rhode Island, which is, as we've learned, a lot smaller than even Israel. Right. Yes. Yes, it is. Mr. Lee Neely is here with us. Lee, welcome. Ah, great to be here. Looking forward to an interesting conversation. Absolutely. Here with us for this interview is Michael Azraf. He has more than 10 years of experience in the startup world. He's been part of six different startups, filling out several positions up to VP of R&D, both on the technical and operations side. In his last pos position at Atlas, Michael built and managed R&D development. He led the Israeli team of the startup on a daily basis uh, from day one to the release of the product. Uh, you can find out more about Michael's company called Vicarious at securityweekly.com forward slash Vicarious. Michael, welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello from the Holy City. It's wonderful to have you on, Michael, uh, and here talking about vulnerabilities and vulnerability management uh, and your take on it as it's a hot topic uh, here in the show and in many enterprises and businesses across the world uh, that are basically faced with how do I manage all of these vulnerabilities and get rid of them. You've got a unique take on it, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm excited to have you on. So I'll turn it over to you to kind of uh, give an introduction as to uh, what Vicarious is and what you're working on. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Paul. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, when we started the company, uh, one of my co-founders, Roy, which was on the uh, micro interviews uh, uh, last week, uh, he was a CISO for, for a big organization in Israel. And he was always telling me about these huge, huge reports that you're getting, like mm -hmm. the VA scanning reports. Uh, and at the end of the day, like the organizations uh, uh, struggle with few things uh, around this report. Uh, and after we started the company, like I, we went to, uh, to a few customers and we asked them about this report. Like we had one client with, uh, uh 50,000 assets having over 600,000 findings in his report. Like the poor guy was looking at us and like, what the hell should I do with, uh, with this report? Uh, and then when we started ringing down, like every, every one of them, like we started to figure out like which patches they need they need to install, which, which configuration changes they need to propagate. He was like telling us like, listen, guys, my IT teams, like the, the, the IT department of the organization are not going to let me uh, patch 90% of the of abilities. Like I can do it. it. It will cause downtime. It will cause problems with users that some of the, uh, some of the software will change. Uh, so you have both uh, the stress and, and, and the problems around uh, how many vulnerabilities you have. The second thing is that you have the internal conflicts, like you're always in, in internal conflicts between the security and the IT, like IT wants to patch every, like IT doesn't want to patch anything, security wants to patch everything. Uh, and at the end of it, 
you have tools that can help you solve some parts of the process, but but they can't really uh, take everything. And once you will have a product that takes everything, it's probably going to be an orchestrated solution that is going to maybe uh, fix some of the uh, discrepancies and some of the problems along the process. But at, at the end of the day, it's not a consolidated solution. So even if you're going to patch stuff or something is going to get into the patching cycle and it's going to take like two, three months until it's getting patched and, and, and then the vulnerability is remediated, even then you're going to run another scan. So you're going to have all the gaps that you have from the previous scan plus all the new ones, uh, all the new vulnerabilities, all, 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 the, new patch, all the new patches that, that have emerged since, uh, uh, since the last time you did the vulnerability assessment scan. So you're always, like, you're always reactive. And even this reactivity has a huge lag of like three to six months that you're always running after one, the vulnerabilities, uh, second, the patches, and the patching cycles inside the organizations. Uh, so this is what some of our, our guiding lines, once we started Vicarious, like we're tr we, we are trying to first consolidate this solution and give, uh, uh, and give tools to help organizations to secure themselves even if they can't really patch stuff so uh yeah it, you it, have it's interesting michael like there's three challenges and I've, I've been in this exact position where i've got to find the vulnerabilities that's step one two i've got to maybe convince some folks to patch it right three is uh, i may also have to convince people to remediate it and maybe steps two and three i have to do both of those right like i need to push the patch out but i also need to maybe update my endpoint um you know security software i need to update my configuration somewhere and so now there's like two or three different groups that may you know may have to work together to do that and if i want a cohesive process as you've described i have to tie basically three or more different products together with some kind of automation to do that which is difficult yeah and even and even on top of that like the like even if you're a very advanced organization and you, you you're trying to like you you have some automation program on top of that you have even another tool. Like you have, you have an orchestrated solution right. that that's that's supposed that's supposed to like. So you have even more tools that, that you need to have that you need to handle. So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily limit the problem. It is just create more management overhead. Right. Yeah. I just keep adding more. Like I have my vulnerability scanner, and then I add another product to help me prioritize it, and then I have another product that helps me report on it and automate it and tie it all together. And I, I organizations really have all types of different solutions they're trying to string together. Lee? Uh, th uh, there's, one, there's one more piece that, I, that hit me, and that is you've got the CIO or equivalent saying, okay, when you do that, don't break anything. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And how, how, where, where are you guys fitting to help all this? this I'm, I know this is an, a, a really complicated problem set. Where are you focusing? Yes, yeah, so that, that's, that's a good question. Uh, so most of the, like, and we looked at the market as it evolved because the company has been around uh, for, for a while. We look at the market as, as it evolved and, and, and what you have today is products that help you fix one of the problems. Like you, you, you have products that will, that will do the vulnerability assessment scan really, really good. You have products that will do the prioritization, uh, the prioritization piece really, really good. Like they're gonna correlate a lot of data and, 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 and stuff like this. You have really good patch management solutions. Uh, but we didn't like when we started the company. We didn't look at, at at this problem as a problem that needs to be one orchestrated or needs to be divided between different products. We just said, okay, you have a piece of vulnerable code running inside the organization. You need to fit, you need to find it first. You need to prioritize and understand the criticality of it, and then uh, and then mitigate it. And it's in, in our opinion, it shouldn't be under three platforms. One, so it's it's first a consolidated solution that. That takes the whole uh, that takes the whole stack. And second, like if you really look at at the vulnerability assessment market, let's take for example the ADR market or the firewall or the WAF markets. All of them went like one or two generations ahead. Like you have next generation antivirus, then you have deep learning, uh, WAF. You have all this kind of Rasp and things like this. Vulnerability management, like the the, the reactive way that that we're doing vulnerability management, hasn't really changed. Like. We have a vulnerability. Someone finds a vulnerability in some software. You can either sell it on the dark web for hundreds of thousands of dollars or report it to NVD, then report it back to, to the vendor. Then the vendor has like three months' years to release the security patch. Then 
everyone needs to understand where the vulnerability is. And then you have the cycle inside the organization, which you need to test the patch because as you said before, the CIO doesn't want to break everything. If you have a .NET uh, app that is running on a server, you're not going to update the .NET, even though uh, it, it has a security flaws. So like th this whole process didn't really advance to the world of machine learning, uh, AI, deep learning, et cetera. So our vision is first to take the entire stack, like provide you one-stop shop, provide you all-in-one mobility management and patch management and remediation solution. But on every part of the process, provide you capabilities uh, that are not no, no longer reactive, things that are proactive. So we can uh, we can first uh, understand which uh, uh, which binary areas inside the code are inside compiled code, meaning like all, all the stuff that we are doing are completely binary. Uh, understand which techniques are hidden inside third-party software you have. Uh, prioritize it based based on 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 the usage inside the organization. So because we know to understand very deeply how software is structured inside the organization, we also know to understand what are the execution properties of, of every asset. So for example, if you have a vulnerability that requires admin privilege, et cetera, we can tailor it back and provide you the patching plus a uh, uh, virtual patch. It's not really virtual patching, we call it patchless protection, uh, which basically wraps uh, the components of the software and memory, like wraps the executables, wraps the sensitive locations inside the libraries. So what, what I like about uh, the solution, Michael, is I have one platform, right? It's helping me identify vulnerabilities. It's helping me prioritize those. And it's helping me with the remediation. I can install the patch if I want to, or I can use your technology to basically protect that application. And the intelligence tells me that, hey, there's a vulnerability in, let's say, Firefox. And 80% of your users are using Firefox and they're vulnerable, like, do you want to just put the protection in there? I'm like, yes, go do that, right? And just kind of simplifying this whole complex problem down to based on usage, uh, risk, and prioritization uh, and leading right to that remediation without several committee meetings about what patch is going to go out and where it's going to go, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I, I think you're starting to touch the last point, like the last part of, of, our, of our solution. So... You, you, like most of the processes today, like most of the incidents response uh, today in the organization can be orchestrated and can be automated using uh, tools like uh, XOR and, 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 and like mm -hmm. former Demiso and stuff like this. Uh, some of the operational, like the operational labor that involves both IT and security uh, in organization doesn't like didn't really took this this approach. Like we can't, we don't really see uh, organizations that that will automatically patch 90% of their servers because, because they're simply afraid. So uh, the fact that we have both this, uh, exactly the, the, the intelligence that you said, we know to understand where are the critical points inside, uh, inside your infrastructure. And second, we have the patchless capability that, that allows you uh, to wrap something until you will be able to, to patch or, or if the software is end of life or it's something that was homegrown, mm. you don't have access to the source code, you can just secure it there. We're also adding automation layer on top of everything. So you will be able to define rules like, okay, there is a critical CVE, but there is no patch. Okay, wrap patchless, and once the CVE is out, mm -hmm. uh, start with this group of computer, test it, see that there are no crash dumps, uh, ask the users if, if anything has changed in the system, and then move on on the patch cycle. It's awesome. So, Je oh, uh, Jeff and then Lee. <laughs> Jeff, I think you're muted. And I've been screaming for the last yeah. 10 minutes. Uh, my apologies. Uh, Michael, you may not be familiar with my role on the show, but I, I am the uh, compliance spoiler. Uh, and, and, inter and I focus primarily on the payment card industry, PCI. Interestingly enough, the term vulnerability assessment does not appear in the PCI data security standard. So my question, somewhat loaded, but also somewhat a, a curiosity, I, I was looking at the Vicarious website and you're talking about security assessment and the security cycle. You mentioned vulnerability management, vulnerability assessment. Could you 
hopefully very quickly just sort of take a step back and and define some of these terms and how they work together the way you see it in typical organizations. Not trying to trip you up, but uh, I, I like to try to level set on terminology. So, you know, what is a security assessment? How does vulnerability assessment and vulnerability management, how does that all work together in sort of this uh, security cycle that you talk about on your website? Yeah. So yeah, that's a great question, and I think that uh, uh, security, security in general, like it, uh, like security assessment in general, has three components. The first component uh, is, is is the internal scans, which uh, is what we do. Afterwards, you have the external scans, like scanning a public domain websites, scanning uh, I don't know everything that everything that is not inside the perimeter, which actually now everything is outside of almost everything is outside of the perimeter <laughs> because we work from home. Yeah. Uh, so you have the second layer of external uh, external risk assessment, and then you have, let's call it the new layer of uh, of uh, trying to figure out, like trying to understand attacks before they are uh, before they are launched against the organization. So it's like companies that are doing a, a, a dark web analysis and trying to figure out whether your organization is going to be targeted. So I think that uh, that in general, uh, the field that that like inside this process. Uh, we're dealing with uh, with the internal risk assessment process. Uh, more specifically, uh, we're handling uh, uh, the, in, the risk assessment and vulnerability management for managed devices. Uh, so mm-hmm. today, uh, today we're running on the endpoint. It can be a server. It can be uh, it can be a server endpoint. It can be an, an anything that, that that is installable. So uh, everything that everything a part of that, that 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 is involved inside the internal scanning, we still don't cover, but we're working on it. For example, uh, uh, device scanning, etc. We still don't do that, uh, but everything that is related to managed devices is where we are, uh, where we at. Um, yeah, so so pretty much internal assessments. Great, thank you. And and via you need an agent on the endpoint, right, to do everything that we talked about. And I think the industry has come around to realizing that if I'm going to put an agent, I want functionality and. I think you've built great functionality because I, I love, and we're going to get into a lot more technical sessions coming up on future segments about that technology inside that does the protection, uh, the we call it patchless or, you know, I, the terminology I, I think has some negative connotation with it, but I've, you know, Michael's briefed me on the technology and I'm super excited about it. So stay tuned. We'll, we'll dive deep into, into that upcoming segments as well. Lee, sorry, you also had a question. So, you know, it's all good. So what I actually wanted to check, as I was listening to Michael describe what he was doing, I felt like we're moving, we, he's going to empower an organization to go from, you know, patch all the things to being much more surgical and focused on dealing with the underlying issue and either patching or mitigating, as he's describing, wrappering uh, objects to keep, to, to, to protect them from being exploited. And it felt like, the net effect could actually, I could take an organization and raise their maturity in terms of keeping their stuff secure. Am I off the deep end here or is that kind of where you are? Yeah, so that, that's, that's exactly, that's like the, the, the company tagline is patch dash less uh, vulnerability management and patch less for us means two things. First, we're going to help you patch wherever it, it will affect, uh, uh, it will affect your cyber hygiene, your cyber, your cyber risk posture in the best way, and we're going to do it with uh, extremely advanced prioritization uh, tools. So everywhere, it's really, really critical for you to patch. We're going to tell you, and we're going to do it for you. Uh, and wherever you can do it, uh, or, or or it's less critical for now, just wrap our our patchless piece, and 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 you you can still be secure until the point you will be ready to patch. Uh, so yeah, that's that's exactly that's exactly uh, where we at. And I think that Matt also described it in in. Uh, in a pretty good way uh, a few weeks ago when we talked. So I, I, I think that by now, like you have a pretty established $6 billion market called vulnerability assessment. But I think that like a lot of the vendors in the vulnerability assessment market understand that if you already have an agent, the expectation from you is always on the rise. So they're also adding capabilities like patch management. So the world is starting to shift from vulnerability assessment and vulnerability discovery to vulnerability remediation and vulnerability prioritization because companies uh, companies are tired that that, that that vendors coming to them and tell them how shitty their 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 cyber risk posture is. They they want something to help them with that. 
Uh, so yeah, that's that's exactly what, what we are trying to be. We're trying to be an operational tool, tool that gaps between uh, the IT and security departments inside the organization and in significantly increase the cyber risk posture of the organization. Yeah, and Michael, you're spot on. When we talk with people um, that have been uh, breached uh, or had a security incident, it's almost never because they didn't know that they had a vulnerability, right? At some level, you know, they may have to dig a little to find it, which speaks to the state of vulnerability scanning and management tools, right? But they know they had that vulnerability. It was in a report somewhere. A sysadmin knew about it. A developer knew about that vulnerability. That's not the problem, right? The problem is fixing the stuff that really matters before you have a breach, right? And so now I can go off and get another vendor, which segues into my question to help me prioritize that. But um, I guess in the vicarious solution, how much do I have to tell it what is the most critical and or sensitive and maintain that so that your product knows, uh, like based from me telling it, hey, this is a really super critical asset? Or does it help me like learn that as it goes or is there a combination yes so so uh yeah i think paul that's that's a great question uh, and i think that at the end of the day and i always tell it to my team internally like when, when we're working on something for example we're adding a new section to the website i always tell them whatever you do that is manual that it doesn't pull the data from other source that doesn't do it automatically it's just not going to happen because if someone is in charge of it and this guy is on vacation i don't know where he is uh, he has more important things to do, et cetera. It's not going to get done. And 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 what you right. said is completely correct. Like most of the big bridges, like even Equifax, they knew about the vulnerability. Right. Uh, but prob- we, we like interviewed probably- actually, Mike, we did. We interviewed the person who was at Equifax uh, during the breach. And he was the, I forget his exact title, but he described exactly that. He's like, oh, no, we, we knew the stuff. We just couldn't, you know, get our stuff together to actually get it fixed in time. Yeah, and, and and you know it's 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 an organization with uh, it's it's an organization. I, I, I'm 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 pretty sure that they have the perfect patch management program. Like they, they right. had they had a, a whole team that is doing vulnerabilization. Mm-hmm. They had a whole team that is doing vulnerability management. But 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 if if you focus on 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 uh, uh, I don't know patching 1,000 flash players that are sealed in an environment that doesn't even open to the DMZ and can get exploited, instead of uh, you know, patching uh, an Apache Tomcat server that right. has a DMZ connection and is always in memory and running with a strong account, like that, that's that's what happened. You don't have this piece of intelligent and contextualization. And on our platform, you don't need to do, like you don't have any manual work. Like we have our own set of rules. We call them X tags. It stands for exploitation tags. We're simply tagging execution of, of a software on an asset. And we can do it in various ways. Mm-hmm. You know... So- uh, it, Go ahead, John. I'm perhaps oversimplifying this, and and maybe it's just you know everybody knows this, and it's just come to me. But it, you know we've been talking about prioritization for I don't know maybe the last year or so. It's it seems to be the next big thing within the security industry. You know we've got this plethora of vulnerabilities. Now we got to figure out how to prioritize them. And I guess I never really thought through it, but it it, it really seems like. Uh, instead of looking at the criticality of the vulnerability, you're looking at the criticality of systems. Uh, that seems what like a lot of companies are doing. Um, and I guess the hacker in me says, yeah, but it's not just the criticality of systems. It's how it's what's the path to those systems? How difficult or easy is it uh, to get to those systems? And, and uh, I, Am I making an accurate perception, uh, uh, conclusion, and, and am I missing any major components, or is it is it does it really boil down to identifying critical systems based on whatever the business uh, criteria is, uh, and and the path to those systems? Is, is there any other major moving parts, or is that pretty much it? And it's how well you can you can do that in an automated fashion. So, so I I think I think that the the like most most of the companies uh, that, that that are doing prioritization today are trying to uh, to to tie uh, the business uh, uh, the business aspect of a single asset to the criticality level of it, but uh, but we don't see it this way. Like like we don't like we think that if you have if you have a vulnerability that that is a low hanging fruit for a hacker. It, it doesn't really matter because, as I said before, if he's inside, he can do lateral movement and get to your Active Directory, get whatever 
wherever he wants. So we don't really look at at the business context of uh, of of a, of a certain uh, server or an endpoint. We look at what can what can make what can be uh, easily exploitable, and if you will take a look at, at the, the new CVSS um, method of of, uh, of Mitre, they are talking about like you have a whole section of environmental properties where you like like when uh, for example if you have a vulnerability, this vulnerability is required to have a user interaction. This vulnerability is required to have a certain privilege in order to get exploited so it doesn't it doesn't really matter like what, what, what is the server or what is the endpoint as long as this set of rules this set of properties are applied to this software and if you have a vulnerability with these properties you probably should patch it as soon as can or you should protect it in other methods but we don't really see it as, as a something that is uh, directly tied to the uh, to the business aspect of, of, of this of this uh, of this digital asset in the organization. Fair enough. Let me ask a, a, a specific question. Uh, not looking for right or wrong, but just your take on it. It's an argument that I used to have when Paul and I were at Tenable over uh, how to respond to, at least from a compliance perspective, because you know Tenable was involved not only in secure security, but also was a it is a tool that's used by a lot of companies that are pursuing compliance first, shall we say, rather than just security, mm-hmm. or at least a both end. Um, and and I I used to argue with Renault, you know, the developer original developer of Nessus, all the time over cryptographic vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, when I was there, uh, was when. Uh, 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 SSL and TLS was coming under the gun, and mm-hmm. it was a big deal for the PSI, PCI data security standard. They had to reissue uh, their uh, a version of their security standard uh, based on you know very recent hot off the presses discoveries about cryptographic vulnerabilities as- associated with SSL, and, and then early versions of TLS, which wasn't technically new. Because uh, NIST is the sort of uh, governing authority over the crypto- cryptographic vulnerabilities, or, or, or you know whether a, a, an al- cryptographic cryptographic algorithm can still be used or not, or what key length, or so on, so on and so forth. They had they had made announcements a while ago. So so anyway, my question is: when it comes to something like uh, a cryptographic vulnerability. You know, like a, a hashing, like SHA one or something like that, where uh, a, a mathematician, a cryptographer, will tell you, "Oh my gosh, you know, this is vulnerable. It it, it it's been broken because you know we've done some computational thing where we've we've you know for." For in the case of SHA-1, we, we've caused a collision. Therefore, it's bad. You know, the the, the cryptographic vulnerabilities associated you know, with uh, SSL and TLS, you know, had to do with lots of math and 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 having the ability to crunch a lot of numbers to produce. Uh, uh, this was Renault's position. I didn't completely disagree with them. Uh, very little fruit, you know, fruit for the effort. Very little payoff. You know, you'd have to put all sorts of computational time in to get maybe one, uh, you know, payload, one data set, which in a PCI context might be one credit card. Is it even worthwhile? Um, the point that I always made to Renault was yes, but PCI says use strong cryptography based on NIST, NIST says bad, therefore don't we as a scan engine have a responsibility to tell our customers whether they're PCI or government, who also has to abide by the NIST rules, this is bad simply because we say so. But at the end of the day, I agreed with Renault in that, yeah, but you know, the cryptography, the the math involved, the, the number crunching, and the payload, the payout, is often yeah, it's a it's a little bit hypothetical. Nobody's really doing this. There's other ways to get to the data. Is the juice worth the squeeze? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And, and you know, so a long winded question, but basically, it's you know, how do you got? What's your guys' take on the types of vulnerabilities that are you know more theoretical in n- nature, which are often cryptographic 
in nature, but not all the time. But, you know, a lot of planets have to be in, a, a, in alignment. A lot of conditions have to be just so, you know, how much do you take that into consideration in, in terms of uh, risk prioritization? Yeah, so uh, a lot of times when, uh, when, when, I'm, when I'm being asked about, about uh, exactly similar questions to, to, to what you said, I think we should take it to, to, the, to the world of medicine. Like in, in, the, in the world of medicine, you have you have the traditional medicine and traditional medicine, you have symptoms. Uh, OK, so mm-hmm. every time we saw the symptoms, we provided the same treatment. Then you have personalized right. medicine, which involved DNA in this in this process and said, OK, this guy has a certain DNA characteristics that might imply that in the future he's going to have a certain disease. And also the treatment is going to be according to his DNA. OK, so you both have the, the symptoms and, and the treatment both personalized for, for, uh, for the patient. Uh, and, and lastly, you have, uh, uh, which is the most recent one, lastly, you have the, uh, the predictive medicine, and it's, which said something pretty uh, dramatic and, 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 and drastic. It says, we're not going to wait until you're going to have a certain illness or, or a certain disease. We're going to understand what is the likelihood of something getting like some person getting uh, getting a certain disease, and then we're going to take proactive measures in order in order to reduce the chances of him getting this disease in the future. Uh, and and I think I think it flips back to to what you said. Uh, the the NIST uh, the NIST PCI it's like it's like the generic symptoms that they tell you. Listen, you have you have this you have these symptoms. You have to take this medicine. That's it. You, you need to do that. And I think that uh, that our platform like. You can't go and reinvent the vulnerability assessment market without looking back to what, like, like without providing the traditional medicine. So, so what we do is that we're not only taking in account uh, the dynamic uh, execution uh, uh, properties of, of the software. We also we also have data that we bring from the outside. For example, which vulnerabilities uh, has an exploit, which vulnerabilities are recently uh, got uh, got hacked, etc. We also we also crafting our own data. For example, we have we have knowledge of which vulnerabilities are being trended on Twitter, and things like this. So uh, as for your question, uh, it's the fact the fact that that we're doing all this next generation stuff doesn't mean that that, that we're saying okay, the old world uh, is, is is no longer effective. If if you like if you're disrupting uh, an, an existing market, the expectation from you are pretty high. Like because you because we need to provide everything you had before. And provide on top of the next generation, but it doesn't mean that that we, we don't do what what you used to do before. So we're providing both things. Yeah, it's interesting. In Stuxnet, there was an MD5 hash collision vulnerability that led to the creation of a code signing certificate. Was that the story? I don't remember all the exact details, but the uh, vulnerabilities that some of what you described, Jeff, were actually used in in Stuxnet. So. I guess, Michael, right. you know, the question is, in when you're prioritizing my vulnerabilities, do I need to tell you that I'm worried about nation-state attacks? Are you making the decision that I should be worried about nation-state attacks? Does that play into, into priority? Because these attacks do happen, but I think they're a lot more rare than, uh, you know, the Apache Tomcat vulnerability, for example, right? So at, at the end of the day, I think that, uh, that hacking is, is, is a matter of, of, um, of, of fi- like, it's, it's a matter of ROI, of, of return of investment. Uh, if someone is trying to hack your organization and the organization has a very uh, dirty uh, a cyber hygiene, it will be easier and simpler for him to, to hack it. He will just do it. If, if your organization is like you have the best locks and you have the best, uh, you, you, have, you have the best security measures, which, which makes you a less sexy target for, for a hacker, he would just move to the next one. I think mm-hmm. this, is, this is how most of the attacks looks like. In cases of state-sponsored attacks and, 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 and things like this, uh, you, you know, in, in, in Stuxnet, for example, the, the, the operation was so complex and it didn't only involve like technical stuff. It also involved uh, like, you know, third party uh, uh, vendors and, 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 and bringing the system when it's already uh, has some, uh, some flaws inside. So actually, like on, on the one hand, we will help you uh, protect yourself from most of the uh, like most of the attacks, like most of the script kiddies that will just try to uh, to, to get a hold of, of the organization and, and and penetrate inside. But because we're doing all this 
uh, binary analysis and, and, and third-party uh, software vulnerability prediction, uh, we can also help you understand what threats uh, are inside software you have based on previous techniques. So for example, if we saw a certain technique previously, for example, what you said before, and we know to characterize, like we know to characterize uh, how the abused uh, API or abused uh, memory space look like, we will also be able to look for uh, dissimilar targets, so-called, in other software. So we will mm. we will gotcha. provide you the cyber hygiene that that that, that will keep you safe from from the script kiddies. But on top of that, we also provide you a super intelligent and 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 next generation capabilities that will help you understand what is the risk in third party software even before it's getting hacked. So. Yeah, it's it's reducing mm. your uh, your footprint and your attack surface so that you can make more intelligent decisions about, okay, now I am going to go, you know, fix those, uh, you know, hash collision vulnerabilities because I'm protected in these other areas. And now that's likely the attack, right? You're kind of like squeezing it down because the average everyday, you know, exploit paths uh, are, aren't available. And when you squeeze it down, now that's the stuff I, I should probably worry about too, right? So it's kind of that uh, building on the prioritization uh, on the remediation, right? And, and, and I, I think you're completely correct. And we had discussion a few, a few days ago, uh, you and me, and, and which, which this is exactly what, what we said. We said security teams are no longer doing security. The, 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 they're doing a bunch of other stuff. They're doing the IT stuff. They're, they're doing mm. uh, the, the running after uh, the third party vendor analysis reports and stuff and things like this. They don't really do security. And if, if, if you take this burden off them, like you're saying, okay, we, you're going to have an automated solution that is that's going to take care of, 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 of my at least my my internal uh, cyber hygiene. They can focus on other stuff. Like they, they can focus exactly on what you said. They, they can focus on, okay, we have we have this software that that we bought from a third party vendor that I have, I don't know anything about it, but I have this company Vicarious that can provide me a risk analysis report. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start checking this this third party vendor and and if he has a components inside his binary software uh, uh, that, that that seems suspicious to me I'm gonna ask questions uh, and uh, and that this I, I think I think that the operational uh, the, the operational challenge is is, is the bigger bigger one because you can't cope with everything that is going on like you have 300 vulnerabilities every, every week you don't have enough human resources to do everything even if you have 15 people on on your security team mm. so I, I i think it's it's like the main manual labor intensive work that, that is causing this process to be so hard yeah and i really when the we talk about organizations that are uh very resilient to attacks it's not just because they have a great security team they have that right but their security team has figured out how to leverage the other resources in their organization to increase their security level, right? And, and this is where I see security going. I want us as security professionals to be less operational. I want the operations to be applying patches, to be using some of the same software, oh, yeah. right? And I want security to be doing security research and Sorry. risk analysis and all the other things that we don't have time for because our hands are in the operations because we have to, right? And I, I think Vicarious and, and other uh, solutions that I really like are really pushing that to the operations teams, right? I want my help desk. I want my network admins. I want my sys admins. That they're doing their job, and security is part of it, right? And that puts less burden on the security team. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm of, sitting. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead Lee. So what I was thinking is, um, I'm like trying to build a mental wiring diagram of of what would what you're what you're offering. I love the idea of a Operational group taking care of the patches, uh, definitely they're in the right spot to do it. But I was thinking, where do you sit with respect to tools I have today? Do you replace things? You're integrated. I know you're a cloud solution. I get that. And so that can give me great up-to-date feeds from the analysis you're doing for helping me make good decisions. But am I retiring other tools or, 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 or are you partnering with them, driving them? What's, what's the model? Yeah, so so that that's that's a good question. Uh, so we, we are going after the market of of uh, vulnerability. Like if 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 you take on, on a business perspective, okay, let's let's switch the hat from from this security professionals to, to business. Uh, you have like we're touching here in three different markets. We're touching on the, on the vulnerability management market. We're touching on the vulnerability prioritization market, also called the risk based uh, vulnerability management, uh, and we have parts of of uh, patch management. Uh, 
the vulnerability assessment market worth uh, six million dollars, growing fifty percent a year. Uh, the privatization market is still a growing market, worth around two hundred million, grow sixty percent a year. So it's still a blue ocean. And you have the patch management, uh, the patch management market, which is a pretty small one. It's like half billion dollar. That doesn't grow in in a, in a, in a very extensive way. Uh, so. Where we want to be is definitely on the vulnerability assessment, which is slowly shifting into vulnerability prioritization and remediation because uh, tools tools that are doing only vulnerability assessment can like they, they can justify their existence inside the, the organization security stack. Um, so uh, we we are we are trying to be uh, we are trying to take uh, the part of vulnerability assessment and vulnerability uh, prioritization. Uh, to us, uh, the last part, which is which is like we have three parts. We have the analysis part, we have the prioritization part, and we have the act part. Uh, the act part. So we have today we have patching capabilities, in, in, like we have patch man, full patch management capabilities inside our agent. We have the patch list, but we see much more uh, things that that are being added there. Uh, so along the way, we will definitely add more integrations. Uh, to the to the last part, the part of the act, uh, but for the analysis and, and the prioritization, this is the this is our uh, this is our holy grail. Like th this is where we are, and and afterwards we will add more and more integration that will help you remediate stuff. Awesome. Um, so as you mentioned, your agent, uh, what platforms are you you on today? So uh, today we're supporting all, all uh, flavors of, uh, of Linux. Uh, we're supporting uh, Windows uh, 7 and above. Uh, we're now, uh, by the end of the year, we're going to release also uh, a Mac OS X support. Uh, and we also have, uh, we also have uh, container support, meaning that, that you, you, you can install, like we have pre-built, uh, we have a, a, a build for uh, Docker containers uh, for the OS level. Uh, so we, we will be, we are trying to first cover everything that is managed and afterwards go, uh, to the device scanning and the network scanning part. Cool. Michael, the, you have, uh, um, you have some free resources, uh, on your website. Have you made those, uh, public? Um, can you talk about those? Oh yes. Yeah. So, so we recently, we recently launched our, our research center. So, uh, uh the, the research center first includes all the CVE data. But more interesting than that, uh, one like uh, uh, one of our one of our main cores uh, uh, of of the system is the ability to understand how software is structured. So, for example, we, when we uh, when we install in a certain organization for a POC or or a trial, first thing we're going to do is is a full asset and software inventory. But we're not going to stop there. We're going to drill down into every software and understand where it resides on the disk. What are the resources? Uh, uh, what are the libraries, et cetera. Uh, and so some of that knowledge is also exists on the website. For example, you can go and, and search for Firefox or, or, or any other software and understand what is the software uh, structure, what is the ecosystem of it. And this uh, also draws out pretty in a, in a pretty good way the way we do our protection because uh, once you have the context of what is a software, it's much more easier to protect it because uh, at the end of the day, we're not trying to, you know, we're not an EDR or an EPP solution, which try to find all the bad guys on the computer. We, we're saying something that is, that is pretty different. We're trying to understand what is the, uh, uh, what is the structure of the app? And once we have the structure, then we're going to wrap around it, our, our uh, memory defense protection, but it, it's, it's, it's not going to be just uh, uh, something that is going to analyze every kernel uh, uh, level, uh, kernel level activity that every executable is doing on the computer, we just identify what is like how the software looks like and then protect it there. So the website gives you a glance of how we do that uh, and shows you, uh, uh, shows you like different uh, structure of, of software uh, that, that, that we collected and, and analyzed. Outstanding. Jeff Lee, more questions for Michael? No. Oh. Jeff, did Not you questions have one? is well. It was more of an observation. I, I think it's fascinating that more and more people are coming to the conclusion that f you know certain certain functions that we traditionally lumped under the category of security are really not security by essence. They're really 
you know, just the job of IT operations and other groups. Uh, I, I find it fascinating that you've picked up on that. I, I gave a talk a couple years ago that, you know, based on the basic risk equation, uh, asked the question, all this stuff, that, you know, 90% of this industry, which is vulnerability based, fits into a specific uh, variable within a risk equation. And security is another separate element or variable in the equation. So how can they be the same thing if they're completely different you know maybe a little bit too esoteric but you got you kind of fleshed it out a little bit which i agree with the i think the irony or the 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 conflict comes into play where uh you know we, we talked to so many companies that are trying to tackle vulnerability management vulnerability prioritization and their tools and their their customers have traditionally been the security folks uh how do I do have a question. How do you how do you push that into the hands of the not security p- people that that should be doing it preemptively so that security can move on to do other better, more fruitful things? Uh, you know, it, it's probably a marketing campaign. You know, that tries tries to redirect towards the the non security trained element. But you know, putting the tool into the right hands for the right purpose. Uh, that's a security function, but it's not. I, I find it fascinating and and challenging. And good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yes. Yeah, so so I, I I think that we need to divide the market into two kinds of of, of organizations. Uh, the first organizations is organizations that has that has well established uh, security teams, and they have a well established IT teams. Sometimes they will even have a dedicated teams that are doing vulnerability assessment. Even vulnerability, even teams that are doing uh, uh, vulnerability prioritization, I can tell you that that some of the big some of the big organizations, some of the big enterprises have built tools, uh, have internally built tools in order to prioritize threats because uh, the, the, this this problem is is just is just so hard to fix because they have three teams. Somewhere these teams are not even in the same continent. Uh, which one team is doing the patch management? One team is doing the uh, the vulnerability assessment, and you know a- everyone is yelling. Like so, so who is ye- who is who is yelling stronger, the, the the security or or the IT? So, on on the one hand, when you involve a big organization, that requires a political change. Like you need to understand that you need to tie it up either the CISO or the CSO or, or, or the CIO, whoever is politically stronger, tie them into the process. And then make uh, a, a real change in, in the culture, which is hard. Like you completely correct, it's super hard. On the other hand, you have you have organizations. Let, let's call them uh, like the definition of, of a small and medium enterprises in Israel and, and US is pretty different. But let's call organizations from 500 endpoints to 5,000 endpoints or servers. Uh, these organizations many times. Most of the times they will have a vulnerability assessment tools. Uh, sometimes they will also have a patch management solution, but the the process is 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 not really as, as you expect to be. It's 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 a, a big mess. Sometimes uh, the IT is also do, like IT is in charge of security. They don't, they don't even have a CA. So so in, in this kind of organizations, I think that the value is is pretty immediate. Definitely, when you're uh, a self serve cloud cloud environment platform, like you just go to the website like sign up in two seconds and then start start playing with some asset like we're like we we, we tried to take uh we tried to like we went on the hard way like we, we tried to take the model of, of datadog and, and this kind of companies and first developing a solution that is really really easy to onboard really really easy to integrate and then go uh like to the big organization which is which is very like which it's a very unique go-to-market strategy if you're a small israeli startup because what most of these Israeli startups are doing is that they're gonna they're gonna raise like four or five million dollar, get one or two big logos, and then try to raise money. We, we did it in the opposite way, and I think more more healthy way. Because once we will get, uh, w- once we will start having our, our our enterprises, and we're already piercing with them, we're already working with them. Once we will start ramping up with them, we will have a solution that that already uh, has a very strong capabilities. And very easy to operate. Interesting. <laughs> awesome. Michael, thank you so much uh, for appearing on Paul's Security Weekly. Uh, folks that want to learn more can go to securityweekly.com forward slash vicarious. Michael, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. 
And that will conclude this episode of Paul Security Weekly. Thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. Over and out.